Mm. <clears throat> to be standing here with my family and friends and my village, including South King Council President Kenyatta Johnson gave her props for being from South Philly. But Mr. President, in 2005, she was in Harrisburg Square, Sherelle Parker Inn. And I'm referring to none other than my good friend, senior municipal court judge here in our great city of Philadelphia, Lydia Kirkland. Give her a huge round of applause. to have my oath of office administered today by none other than the Honorable Marsha L. Fudge. You need to know that, you know, she was so humble when she just came up here. Uh, but I was uh, two years young in this dynamic sisterhood called Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated when she became our 21st national president. And for my sorors who are in the audience and also my divine nine brothers and sisters, you know how sacred this moment is for me right now to have her here with me. You heard her mention that she was a former mayor, yeah, but as usual, what she didn't tell you is that she was the first female and the first African-American mayor of Warrensville Heights, Ohio. She's the former congresswoman from the 11th district and she is currently the 18th secretary of the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, but she's here today in her own right. Did I say it right? This is surreal. I could have never have imagined this. Thank you, Jesus. Soro Shirley Ralph, where are you? Thank you. Cutting, you cut your vacation short to be here. You could have been in Hollywood right now, but you chose to be here. And I want you to know that I'm grateful. Let me start by thanking my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for whom all things are possible. And for those of you who know me and you know my life, you know that's not a line for me. I wouldn't be standing here today were it not for the grace and mercy of God. It is with that in mind that I say Happy New Year to you, the great city of Philadelphia. <laughs> to our council president, Johnson, newly elected Council President Johnson. It sounds good when we say it. Say Council President Johnson. President Johnson. This is going to work out well, Mr. President. We know how to do this thing called call and response, so we're going to be able to get a whole lot done together as partners. Give our Council President a huge round of applause. To him and to all our members of, of, of city council, the leadership, and all of the members who were elected, uh, to our, our, our faith leaders who are present, all of our, our role officers, thank you so very much for being here and congratulations to each of you. Um, I also want to say to our former mayors who are here, some here, some could not be here, former Mayor Green, Mayor Good is here, trailblazing, trend-setting, history-making, first black mayor of the city of Philadelphia, W. Wilson Good is here. <laughs> Want to acknowledge Mayor Rendell and to Mayor John F. Street, who made the Neighborhood Transformation Initiative a thing people will never forget. Uh, Mayor Nutter could not be here, but he visited me uh, yesterday. And to my good friend, the 99th mayor of the city of Philadelphia, a gentleman who made improving parks, rec centers, and libraries 
his number one priority, but he also understood that if we would give three and four year olds throughout the city of Philadelphia access to the opportunity to get an early childhood education, that by the time they got into kindergarten when they were five years old, they would be prepared to compete with children who had come from more privileged families. So when people ask you about his legacy, I want you to tell them about Mayor Jim Kenney's effort to educate our children, and not just through Rebuild, but through Philadelphia PHL Pre-K. Give them a round of applause, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I see Senator, our U.S. Senator Casey is here. Our Lieutenant Governor, Austin Davis is here, and Congress members Evans, Boyle, and Scanlon are here, along with Speaker McClinton and members of the Pennsylvania uh, General Assembly are here, along with the judiciary. And I'm not sure if it's true, but someone told me that we have Mayor Eric Adams from New York City here. Is Mayor Eric Adams here somewhere? Wherever you are, hello, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I need to stop right here for a second, and he's not expecting this, but I have to give credit where credit is due. The gentleman who served as a council member for the 5th District, along with our council president, who I often refer to as my big brother, council president Daryl Clark, I want you to know that our working together was not something that a whole lot of people ever expected us to do. They wanted us to stay caught up in the past because Council President Johnson, he's got this thing planted in my brain right now about a new day. You've been talking about a new day. And, and, when, and when he and I started working together, people thought we were going to get caught up in the antiquated, outdated territorial tribal warfare that was John Street against, uh, you know, Bill Gray and black, black people just fighting each other for no darn reason at all. And we got a chance to work together when you were president and I was a member of the Pennsylvania General Assembly we did some amazing work for the city of Philadelphia and we laid a strong foundation that we would later build on and I want to give credit where credit is due and say big bro I wouldn't be here standing today on the strong legacy were it not for you give Dow Clark a huge round of applause thank you Thank you. Well deserved. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank each of, each of our elected officials for being here. Um, the reason why it was important for me to go through that list is because for those of you who will take a stroll back mentally and remember the, the primary election and the general election, I kept talking about a thing that a lot of people were laughing at me about. It was called intergovernmental cooperation and planning. And I was saying to people that if it was God's will and they gave me access to the opportunity to become mayor of this city of Philadelphia that I alone wouldn't be able to solve the complex issues that were facing us, but instead we would have to have an intergovernmental cooperation and planning arrangement at every branch of government. Now I hope Philadelphia, because I'm going to talk about this in a second, that you understand what we just did. You just saw the Secretary for the United States Housing and Urban Development here, in her own right, but she's here. You just saw and heard me mention our Lieutenant Governor Austin Davis, our United States Senator Bob Casey, our congressional delegation is here. Money bags, appropriations chairmen in both House and the Pennsylvania General Assembly, Jordan Harris on the uh, House side, and my good friend and my brother and my therapist, State Senator Vincent Hughes, Democratic Appropriations Chairman on the Senate side. And then you've got the lady who keeps all of the order and keeps the structure going, and our Speaker of the House, Joanna McClinton.
if we miss this opportunity to deliver in a meaningful way for the city of Philadelphia, not just for the next four years, but the work that we do now, it should, it should be a foundation of, for the future. Our children should, should be saying in every neighborhood that they go to, wow, I, I, we, we, we saw on a, a video, well they don't even do videos, they streamed it, whatever they did for them, will do for this day in the, in the future. And you know some of the things that they talked about, they got done. Council President Johnson, to every leader whose name I just mentioned, if we don't get, I'm not talking about incremental change, I'm talking about bold, transformative steps that when people walk outside of their houses, they can touch, see, and feel the results of our labor. If they don't see it, it's on us. I wanna congratulate each and every member who was sworn in today, your victory in a new term that begins today. I want to stop now and thank Philadelphians for giving me a chance to earn their support and for believing in me and my vision for the future of our city. When I started on this campaign, um, I wasn't going to say it, but I'm going to tell. Don't get mad. Sincere and Aaron are hollering at me somewhere. <laughs> when I started out on this campaign, I want you to know that you crisscross the city and you talk to different constituencies. And sometimes you will talk to a people uh, and, and the pr primarily the group will be based on race, a black group or a white group or a Latino group, or it will be a low to moderate income community. It will be a wealthy community or a working class community. And we had some experts who came to try to office, offer our little scrappy campaign some advice because we weren't the, the, the biggest candidate in the field. And they said, well, what you should do is you should tell her that if she wants to win, when she goes to the Northeast, she should talk like this. <laughs> and her message should be about that. And so what about when, you know, she, she comes back home to the home base in North Philadelphia, she's uptown, or I'm sitting in the hairdresser at a barbershop in West Philadelphia, or I've been in South Philadelphia, what am I supposed to do? I couldn't do anything, Philadelphia, but affirm, not through words, I had to affirm through my actions that I was going to stay true to who I am, my story, my life, that I wasn't going to try to put on an image that Sherelle Parker is a bastion of perfection, and that if you would just vote for me, everything in our city would change. Because I'm standing on the shoulders of a people who prayed for me in the midst of it all. I could only be here because you, the people of our great city of Philadelphia, from all walks of life who picked up what I put down when I said I won't allow race, class, socioeconomic status, zip code, religion, sexual orientation or identity, that I would not allow any of that to change my message to you and or who I am. So on the day, while I do stand here as the 100th mayor of the city of Philadelphia, sixth largest city, birthplace of democracy. I want you to know that I only get the opportunity to meet this moment because of each and every one of you, and for that, I am extremely grateful. Philadelphia, thank you for allowing me to be me. It's something that I'll never forget.
When I started talking about my background, y'all remember probably the, one of the first intros, um, people were asking me, you know, we don't really see people doing that a whole lot like you. Like, why are you? Like, you, did, I, I, you've been elected for X number of years. I've never heard you talk. I, I never thought you had a life that was so, so difficult, Shirelle. I mean, you've never said anything out loud like that before. Like, why hadn't you shared it? Well, you know, where I come from, you, you do what you do, but I, you know, I don't want any unnecessary, you know, so sorrow or sympathy for me. Uh, I don't want anybody lowering their expectations because you know that life for me ain't been no crystal stair. So I just didn't talk about it a whole lot. But because I've shared it, I hope that everyone in this city will see something of themselves in me and that you, you, will, you will have confidence and that, that you, will, you will absorb a certain amount of grace that I know I get from you, that confidence and grace that will help me lead our city and I hope that will help you help move our city forward. I wanna say this to my young prince. Another thing people didn't want me to say out loud. My young prince, my son, my only child, guess what? I, I told our first lady that as soon as he held the Bible, he said, Ma, he's so over this. He said, can I leave now? <laughs> he's probably with Council President Johnson's children uh, right now. But wherever you are, Langston, if you're under the sound of my voice and you can hear me, I want you to know that Mommy and Daddy love you more than anything else in this world. People were so shocked when they learned that my former husband and I worked extremely hard together, co-parenting our son, and they expected me to just whisper about it or walk with my head, you know, held down and knock my shoulders back. But I, I, I just said, as, after I talked to people, you don't know how many people else, other folks like me it is out there, because people were coming up to me saying, Sherelle, I know it's possible right now. I think I'm gonna pick up the phone and call y'all. I mean, y'all got along so well, I told them don't be getting no fancy pantsy ideas. <laughs> but we do work well in co-parenting our son. Langston, we love you. I don't care what mommy does in her professional life. Our most important role, Ben Mullins and I, is as your mother and father, and we won't allow any thing to get in the way of that. No career, no job, no service, nothing will take away from our bond and nothing will ever take me away from you nor your father. We love you. I want to start on my message today by saying to each of you that by every statistic imaginable, I am not supposed to be standing here today. Why? Because it is true, for those of you who read it, uh, I, Sherelle Parker, was a child who most people thought would never succeed. And they really did almost have it, me thinking the same thing. So right now, lots of people have been asking me, how do you feel? And I've been telling them that there are no words that I can explain the mix of emotions that I'm feeling during this historic moment. I can only tell you that I have a deep-rooted sense of gratitude permeating in my heart and in my spirit since the people of our great city have given me access to this opportunity to serve them in a manner that many thought would be impossible, uh, uh, you know, uh, out of reach for someone like me. So now, what do you mean? I mean, I want to say it out loud that I was born to a single teenage mother without my biological father present in my life. My grandparents raised me, mommy, a domestic worker, a domestic worker from Manning, South Carolina, daddy, a disabled Navy veteran from Accomack County, Virginia, who received public assistance. You, you heard me on the trail talk about that colored money in books. Some people whisper to me, well, what does she mean when she says the public money? <laughs> it means that my grandmother and my grandfather were on public assistance, that they had to receive food stamps and cash assistance to take care of me. I want you to know that were it not for their resilience, their stick to stick to I wouldn't be here. 
I want to say to my family, to my community that brought me up, who believed in me, they believed in the power of education, and they believed that it could change a life. They saw some things in me, and this is important when we look at the state of affairs in our city right now and what our young people are facing on a daily basis because some people act like they are all growing up in Cosby-like families, and that is not the reality. I was the first college graduate in my family graduating from Lincoln University. I was the first graduate of an Ivy League institution acquiring a master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Then I went on to a career as a certified secondary English teacher. And for all the English teachers or teachers in general who are in the audience, don't forget to let people know how hard you work. Let them know you are NTE past and Praxis past uh, teachers, and you are doing extremely hard work in our classrooms. I say all of this to let you know that two quotes, two quotes are the foundation of the work that you've seen me do throughout my career. And if you, when you walked in, you looked on your seat, if you got a book that was an action plan on the back of your seat, raise your hand so I can see if they gave out the action plans. Okay, I want you all to think about Sister Dr. Maya Angelou and uh, a quote that she was um, uh, often stating as she traveled across the country, um, she said that in life, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. The second quote comes from one of my favorite civil rights activists and authors, and it's none other than the brilliant James Baldwin. Um, and, I, and I truly think, and I want you to think about this through the lens of Philadelphians and what they think about those of us who are here on this stage who are elected and who work in government and they see us putting our hands on Bibles and getting sworn in but they go back into their neighborhoods and they're thinking about these promises that we've made but they said, what about me? I don't see it. And so James Baldwin, he, he was often quoted as stating when people said that they supported civil rights, but he hadn't, he hadn't seen it, he would say, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. Now I want you to let those two sink in and to hear from my mouth to your ears that I cannot do this alone. I did not get to this stage by myself. I believe that right now and at this very moment, and I mean this with all my heart and spirit, there's a block party going on in heaven right now. And my ancestors, my ancestors are, are, are saying right now, even my mother and my father took a lot of hours of therapy to save my biological father. They are saying, my single teenage mother and him, thank you God for being the vehicle that allowed us to bring Sherelle in the world. He even used them. My grandmother and my grandfather are listening and daddy is saying, Mary Mason, don't you talk so long. Some people, they don't even know, Mary, young people, they don't even know who Mary Mason is. But <laughs> Daddy, that's, that was my grandfather's nickname uh, for me. And uh, my great aunt Vi, and my, my great grandmother, uh, Big Mert, from 31st and Lehigh. They are all saying, she may not have thought that it was fair, but all of our hard work, the fruits of our labor, look at what it's yielding right now, but this is what she better not ever do because we'll come down from the heavens and touch her. If she ever thinks that any title she acquires, any academic credential she assumes, any professional development that she gets, any ounce 
the power that she gets if she begins to get caught up in reading the headlines and getting used to people calling her Madam Mayor and feeling a tad bit haughty. We will touch her and remind her that the gifts that have been placed in you are not simply for you and your own personal advancement, but you are to use them to motivate, inspire, and encourage others and make a difference in the lives of the people of our great city. It is with this in mind that I want to make sure that I talk about what I promised to the people of the city of Philadelphia. I want to acknowledge that promise, but I also want to acknowledge the shoulders who I stand on. Other women in this city who blazed the path before me, who showed me the way. I couldn't make a promise like that which I am about to refer to had it not been for a lady named Augusta Alexander Clark, Augusty Clark. If I hadn't saw a brawler by the name of Joan Krajewski fighting for quality of life. And what about Roxanne Jones and the C. Dolores Tucker and the first woman president of the City Council of Philadelphia, Anna C. Verna. I am not here but for their years of efforts, their years of fight, their years of service, and I want to give credit where credit is due because I stand on their shoulders. We lost Dr. Constance E. Clayton who was the superintendent of schools when I was in the school district of Philadelphia. And she taught us that we, Philadelphia's children, were capable of anything if we received a high quality first class education. My mentor, the one and only, the boss lady. Vincent Hughes would call it a boss with the hot sauce. I'm referring to none other than Councilwoman Marion Tasco. Thank you. Who raised me politically and governmentally and showed me the way to reach this historic moment. I am here but for my beloved boss lady. I stand on the shoulders of those women. And I've got to say about this gentleman, let me stop here and say this about this gentleman. You, you hear me talk about intergovernmental cooperation and working in a bipartisan manner. I'm not sure if Republican State Senator uh, Ward is, is here or uh, a Leader Pittman or Leader Cutler or any of my, my Republican uh, friends uh, from Harrisburg are here, but I want you to know that I would not have known the value and why it was so essential for a Democrat from Philadelphia to have a relationship with a Republican who may have come from rural Pennsylvania had it not been for a guy who when he got elected, I was eight years old, he was tall and thin and had a whole lot of hair. <laughs> he is now our Congressman Dwight Evans. Give him a huge round of applause. <laughs> Dwight was the one who made me run for the state house, I wasn't interested. I said, who wants to go to Harrisburg? And Marion Tasco supported him and he told me to go to Harrisburg, if you remember, and learn how to be a legislator. Thank you so very much, uh, Dwight. It is some of the greatest value and a professional development that I have ever uh, added uh, to my career. And to you, I wanna say thank you. Um, you all are familiar with Sonia Sanchez, uh, the great poet, uh, and uh, she had a, uh, a, a poem called uh, Love Colored with an Iron Lace, and that is who these women uh, are, and Dwight Evans is to me. It is because of them and uh, because of their faith in me and your faith in me that I am standing here uh, today. However, my Aunt Brenda is here. I don't know where she is. She said to me, so 
You are about to do something special and become the first woman, the 100th mayor, and the first little black girl from the 1900 block of Penfield Street to become mayor of the city of Philadelphia. And she says, well, what are you going to do um, when even before you get started, there are naysayers who doubt the ability to turn the challenges that this city is facing around. What are you uh, going to do when you are trying to move forward and proffer solutions, but all some folks seem to want to do is to wallow in all that is wrong and discuss all of our woes as if where we are now is where we will have to be. What are you going to do when that happens? I made sure that I said to uh, Aunt Brenda, and I want um, you all to hold on with me here. When you hear me begin talking about implementing the action plan that you have a tangible copy of, the reason why you have a copy of it is because it's a commitment to you and that means I'm going to get it done because we gave our word and when we are working to implement the goals that are included in that plan and you hear some people doubting us before we even get started, I want you to say to them, don't throw shade on my Philly shine. And the reason why this is important is because sometimes we forget who we are. With all of our greatness, we forget what a mighty city that we really are. And so I want to say that that promise that I made to people here in our city of Philadelphia, that when I swore this oath as Philadelphia's 100th mayor, first woman to hold the office in 341 years, that I would do so with humility, with respect for the 99 who came before me, and with the solemn promise that if we work together, Council President Johnson, members of this body, along with each and every, you, each and every one of you, we would make Philadelphia the safest, cleanest, greenest big city in the nation with economic opportunity for all. I delivered that vision to you, members of this audience, residents in our great city of Philadelphia. You have uh, responded in the affirmative, and for that, I want you to know I'm grateful. I know it's a tall order, but but we don't want people doing what I call becoming expert AOPs. You know them because you have them in your own lives. These are expert articulators of problems. They can go around and around and around in a circle telling you about a problem, but they are very, very, very short on delivering solutions. They will, they will, it, it's a thing. Um, um, uh, they will begin to remind us that yes, it's true, a quarter of our citizens are living uh, in poverty, um, that despite the progress in lowering the number of homicides, we still have far too many senseless shootings, too much gun violence, and too many illegal guns on on the streets of Philadelphia. We know that our neighborhoods, uh, they too have been struggling under lots of blight, uh, illegal trash dumping, and nuisances that in essence degrade the quality of life and enjoyment of our blocks and of our communities uh, at large. What I'm here to mention to each of you today is that we are going to be laser focused on developing and implementing solutions to address our challenges and we're going to solve them for the people of our city. Because guess what you deserve to see? And this is going to sound like a novel idea. You deserve to see your tax dollars at work in your neighborhoods in a way that you can all see, touch, and feel. You, you deserve policies that come from the ground up with the community involved at every step of the way. Uh, gone are the days where we spend our time and energy focused on people, places, and things that encourage us to wallow in our woes. Hear me, we will not feed into that. As you've heard me uh, say, uh, we are proud Philadelphians and I hope you have watched what we've been putting down recently. If you pick up that action plan, 
You will also know that in recent weeks, we have assembled a team of cabinet members for my administration. And if you put them together, this group of men and women, they are, they are bright, they are sharp, uh, they, they are focused, and they all share one common denominator. Guess what they have in common? They all have a can-do spirit. They have a how spirit. They have a, we must rid our city of this culture of no in everything that we are trying to achieve. I want to make sure people know this. Nobody should ever come to me and tell me, Sherelle, I don't understand why we um, are changing the way we sharpen the pencils. We've been sharpening the pencils this way for 35 years, and I sharpen 10 pencils a day using the rotary pencil sharpener, and this is the only way we know how to sharpen sharpen pencils here in the city of Philadelphia, I want you to know that you will have lost my attention. We must have a mindset of how are we going to do what I call GTY. How are we going to get to G yes? The first way you get to yes is by doing this. You assemble a team of public servants with national reputations as experts in their field, from policing and public safety and organizational management and finance and economics and so many other areas. And I'm proud that we've appointed strong uh, leaders with strong ties um, and experience in the city of Philadelphia. Someone said it's interesting that a lot of these people have lived here and worked here already. I said, well, we look nationally. We just happen to come up with the best, most qualified and connected candidates who don't need a GPS to make it to 52nd and Market Street. They know how to get there. There is so much work to be done, and we cannot wait to get started. Public safety. In our first 100 days included in that plan, my administration will announce specific plans to increase the number of Philadelphia police officers on our streets. Listen, with the focus on community policing citywide. Stop. Sherelle, why is this important? In every neighborhood in the city of Philadelphia, remember Maya's quote, we can't get angry because people who live and work and own a business in our city have told us on many occasions that they don't feel safe in their neighborhoods. And we can't, we can't be angry at them because they have publicly expressed to us how they feel, but this is what we can do. We can tell them that we have a right to do our best to work on rebuilding trust between our police departments and communities who have a reason not to trust, but to figure out by having officers engaged in community policing, walking the beat, riding the bikes, officers there as guardians and not warriors, getting to know the people that they are sworn to protect and serve. Listen, they're because they're making sure things are okay on your on your commercial quarter or at your rec center they are there to build proactive relationships with you and I didn't change my message no matter where I went in the city and you know what we can have both we can have community policing and strengthen those police and community relationships and we can have accountability at the same time where we have zero tolerance for any misuse and or abuse of authority under a Parker administration for any law enforcement official who does not follow the rules. Sherelle, how are you going to do it? We heard you talk about community policing. I'm also going to declare a public safety emergency. Yes, I am. We are going to expeditiously get every available resource into neighborhoods. Listen, struggling from scourges of crime, gun violence, drugs, and addiction. I want you to know this. On a personal note, nothing was more frustrating for me on this campaign trail when I was working to earn your support then someone who said to me, Sherelle, we think you lack compassion when you talk about cleaning up the open air drug markets that have existed in our city. When you have talked about we have to do that now, 
You don't sound very compassionate. I want to say to each of you that our police commissioner, Kevin Bethel, he's going to deliver plans for those crises and other crimes like car theft, shoplifting, yes, that retail theft and the illegal use of ATVs that diminish our quality of life. We are going to use a holistic approach to end, end in our city the crime, particularly the quality of life crimes that we have seen increase, but we are going to have a holistic approach to addressing public health and safety in our city. We're going to stay focused on what you've heard me refer to as the pie, prevention, intervention, and enforcement. Uh, but I want you to know I'm not going to be afraid to make those tough decisions. And if somebody tells you that we think she lacks compassion uh, because she wants to be too aggressive in, in, in cleaning up the open air drug market, you tell them to think about whether or not they would want their mother, father, sister, brother, or loved one on the streets openly using intravenous drugs in front of kids who have to walk by and go to school, business owners who are trying to survive, and people in the community who are saying, please just don't forget about us. We're going to have a data-driven and research-based approach that is put together by the best law enforcement and public health professionals that we can find but I want you to know everybody is not going to be happy when we make some of these decisions. We're going to make our city safe for the people who live here, who work here, and who come into our city from the suburbs and from across the country and from across the world. Everybody's talking about 2026 and are you ready? If we don't get our own house in order before a company comes and if we don't address public safety, we won't be ready to receive anybody in 2026. I want the world to know that I am fully committed to ending this sense of lawlessness and bringing order back to our city and a sense of lawfulness. In lawlessness, bring order back and a sense of lawfulness right here in our city. We know that we can do it when we partner with the community. The partnerships come from the ground up, but there has to be, there has to be a sense that residents who live in the city City of Philadelphia, no matter their zip code, deserve to have a high quality of life in their neighborhoods. I believe, yes, I do believe that everybody deserves that. <laughs> Clean and green. If you want to irk my nerves, let me hear you call our city Philadelphia. We will launch a new approach to addressing quality of life issues like illegal short dumping, cleaning up litter and graffiti, fixing potholes and removing abandoned cars. And y'all know we're not playing because guess what? With those abandoned cars and those tractor trailers, we're going to be calling our friends at the Philadelphia Parking Authority. So that intergovernmental collaboration that we talked about, when you call us and you get mad because a car has been parked on your block, uh, and your weeds are growing through the car, it's been there, there are no tags, and you get frustrated that we, the council members, uh, those who are elected to public office can't get it moved fast enough, we are going to have partnerships. And Mayor John Street, you should be proud because if there was anything that I know people remember from your tenure in office, they will say, we will never forget Mayor Street removing all of those abandoned cars uh, from the city of uh, Philadelphia neighborhoods. So uh, we're going to have our clean and green initiatives, and uh, when we do that, abandoned car removal will be a part of it. But we are also going to expand a successful neighborhood-based commercial core, the cleaning program, called PHL Taking Care of Business. Yeah, I'm really, really excited and proud about that. We're going to organize government and the community and businesses to collaboratively clean up our neighborhoods, beautify our streets, and work to towards a more sustainable future, all with an eye towards environmental justice for underserved and under-resourced communities. Now on housing, 
We are going to create a one front door opportunity for residents to access all city run home improvement programs in one place at one time through one application. We will develop a vision of what I've referred to as affordable luxury. That is, affordable homes with high-end fixtures for homeowners and renters. Uh, we're going to preserve and build more affordable housing. And I talked about a goal of building 30,000 more units of housing. And we're going to provide more support for small businesses. Now, we're going to also do this. And you need to know that says something to be excited about. Um, because what I'm about to say next, some people are going to say, is this really going to get done? We've already started this. We're going to order a top to bottom review of the city's land bank to better understand the challenges of developing vacant and city owned property. And we're going to work to improve that process. If you're like me, I think it's unconscionable that we could have city owned land and talk about having an affordable housing complex. <laughs> we have to do what I've learned how to do. Bring everybody at the table at one time. That means we have to call our state partners and say, please bring PHFA to the table. Call our federal partners and say, please bring HUD to the table. We need our Office of Planning and Development at the table in every office associated with the city. And we have to be intentional about ensuring that the same old actors who have gotten an opportunity to develop these very own properties and build wealth by developing these properties in the land bank, that long-term owner occupants, particularly black and brown people who live in neighborhoods throughout our city, they too deserve access to the opportunity to become developers and build wealth in their city. It's not an either or. If we work together, it's an and. We'll need the building trades. We will again need all of our federal, state, and local partners, and we're gonna need the best and the brightest housing, counseling agencies, and quite frankly, members of the development community who are interested and make a solemn commitment that they do wanna be a part of growing the future of Philadelphia. Next, we wanna talk about economic opportunity. People have often asked me how and why do you think you're standing today? I'm standing because my education and my village and my training helped to put me on a path to self-sufficiency. We want all people on a path to self-sufficiency here in the city of Philadelphia, but they can't do that without access to an economic opportunity, a career learning new skills so that they can earn a living wage, have health care, earn retirement security, and take care of their families. And I want each and every one of you who are here today to know that we can't do that without the business community. I've been so frustrated um, over the past few years there have at times when I've seen this us versus them attitude as it relates to business, as if Philadelphia doesn't need businesses open here in our city. When you take a look at our uh, revenue that we generate to pay bills here in the city of Philadelphia and you realize what a significant contribution wage, business privilege, and net profits tax bring here in the city of Philadelphia, you know we need to do what I'm about to state for the record. We're going to, within our first 100 days, we're going to announce our PHL Open for Business initiative that that is going to do, and I hope you get this, exactly what the council president noted in his remarks. We're going to reduce the red tape that it, make, it, that it takes and in, in, in how it makes it harder to do business here in our city by requiring every department to submit to my office a list of the unnecessary permits and regulations that we can eliminate so that we can make it easier for you to do business here in the city of Philadelphia. So while I've seen a lot of people over the years stand up and give great speeches, I've always been a tangible-based outcome a person. On day one, we want the business community to know that Philadelphia is officially open 
for business. We are open for business here in the city of Philadelphia. This is also something that we're going to do. We're going to eliminate the college degree requirements for many city of Philadelphia jobs so that people with real live life experiences, that they can lend their expertise toward making our city better and open up the door for those good paying job opportunities. Listen, right here in the city of Philadelphia's government, we can do that now. Uh, we've done that, we've started to do that already here in the city of Philadelphia for some employment opportunities, but we must do that across the board. We can follow in the footsteps of Maryland along with our great commonwealth and our governor, uh, Josh Shapiro, but we want to make sure that we remove any barriers to access to opportunities that don't allow our people to be put on a path to self-sufficiency. We are really excited about this agenda. We're excited about under economic opportunity having something that we've never had in the city of Philadelphia before. People seem to have us focus on measuring these numbers in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And a lady named Della Clark and a guy named Harold Epps are beating me over the head all of the time saying, if you don't make it somebody's job to monitor the success of minority-owned businesses, we will never be able to advance and make the case for the capital that we need. Because it's not another program, it's access to capital to move these businesses along. So we're going to be Focus on minority business success. We will have a direct appointment to the office of the mayor and we will convene our business roundtable. And we're going to bring together local, uh, state, and federal officials along with our business leaders who have a stake in the economic success of our city so that we can tap into the intellectual resources of Philadelphia and truly try to create economic opportunities for everyone. Um, as it relates to education, I said on the campaign trail, and I mean this wholeheartedly, we're going to develop a comprehensive strategy to provide meaningful out-of-school programs and job opportunities for students outside of regular school hours. We're going to prepare a strategy for school building modernization and work closely with the school district on its own plan for school facilities. Listen, you heard me say I'm a teacher. Our children have the same right to come to school and receive a 21st century education in a clean, modern school building with state-of-the-art facilities and equipment as does any other child anywhere in this commonwealth. And I don't care if they go to a traditional public, a charter, or a parochial school. While we know what our obligation is to traditional public schools, it won't be a us versus them. We're going to be focused on building quality seats and we're going to be focused on listening to the people who are doing the work on a daily basis who are in our classrooms, our teachers, our administrators, the people on the ground up so that they can provide us with guidance and instruction on what we need to give them in the classroom so that we can be successful. Why is this important? Because that's the only way we're going to be able to keep our schools open from 7.30 in the morning to 6 p.m. at night year round. I want you to imagine, yeah, I want you to imagine the academic enrichment programs and the job programs, uh, workforce development, again, the building trades. If we're building new schools, training our children to build those schools. If we're building new housing, affordable units, or market rate. How about training our young people to be a, a prepared for those opportunities? We have exceptional colleges and universities so that high school graduates are ready to enter the workforce. If we don't find a way to have this out of school time training, we're going to miss a great opportunity to train our next generation of leaders. What, what does the longer hours mean? It means that parents who are working, they don't have to worry about trying to juggle childcare and earn a living to support their family at the same time. They don't have to feel guilty about, I want to take these hours of overtime, but I need to get to school to pick up my child at the same time. 
We're going to do outreach, allowing my team and I to hear directly from those teachers and counselors and those principals on how to best attract, retain, and how to support them. And we're going to seek out committed citizens, and I want you to hear me clearly, to serve our students as members of the school board. Someone said, Sherelle, you shouting that out loud, but they don't get paid. It's one of the most important acts of public service that you could ever contribute to the city of Philadelphia, and we just need more people to consider having access to the opportunity, and not only those people who can afford to sort of mount some kind of campaign. We need those of you who are in this audience and Philadelphians from across this city who have a passion and some academic and educational experience and real life lived experience as it relates to public education to want to be able to help us with this effort. The final issue that I want to talk to you are about something that I mentioned that I wasn't sure a lot of people understood. I like things to be organized and I have never seen here in the city of Philadelphia, an organized structure that allowed the administration to work directly with the business community, the faith-based community, and the intergovernmental community. We will be establishing three round tables, and these three round tables will each have working groups, subject matter experts, for example, growth in life sciences, uh, in biotech, institutions of higher learning, our chambers of commerces, uh, workforce development training programs. We want to bring all of these entities together, the people who will be announced very shortly, who have been selected to become a part of the Mayor's Business Roundtable. We will announce them shortly, but we are going to lean on this group of individuals along with the business community at large to help us solicit and develop better ideas for how City Hall can serve all of the different constituencies and needs of our diverse city. Um, let me be clear again, these roundtables will have active vehicles to make and implement new policies see in this city. So we want your ideas on how we can be more successful. We hope that you will listen uh, to our calls uh, for your leadership to participate and that you will definitely respond. I want you to know that uh, I know this is a lot that we promise. All this we promise we do and more. And I believe in the city government that our people can see, touch and feel with visible actions helping people at the neighborhood level. We want a government that can scale impact, take a solid program, expand what works, tweak what doesn't, and serve more Philadelphians. We want a revival a few blocks from here at City Hall, a city hall that brings out the best of Philly with a more efficient government, one that hears people, is an employer of choice, and relies on intergovernmental collaboration to bring more resources to our city. There will no longer be a tale of two cities in Philadelphia. We are going to close the gap between the haves and the have-nots. We're going to put people on a path to self-sufficiency, and what we're going to do is work on giving people the ability to take care of themselves. On the day I'm asking you to help me again. You helped me get here and stand before you today during this history-making moment. And I don't want you to judge me solely by what I'm about to say, but I need your help one more time. I pronounce that I'm not superwoman. I can't do this alone. We need each and every one of you to be engaged. When, when, you, when you get a call from your city government asking you to serve on a committee or on a board, especially when it comes time for us to get into neighborhoods, and we talk about you know, having our faith-based roundtables uh, you know, conduct uh, informational meetings about educational and employment opportunities with the city of Philadelphia, we need those blocks organized and we need you engaged. And it's going to take all of us, the entire city. With that being said, Philadelphia, I want people of every race, class, socioeconomic status, uh, and gender, every religion, all coming together. I know you will join me. 
I have all of the hope in the world that you will join me. I hope you've been feeling a sense of renewed energy. People have said it to me, Sherelle, we feel something that we haven't felt in the city of Philadelphia in a very, very, very long time. And, 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 and I've said to them, thank you. But if you don't want that feeling to go away, you gotta make sure you're willing to roll up your sleeves and go to work with us. Philadelphia, I thank you so very much for this opportunity. I want you all to say this with me. Now, you've heard it referenced today. The, 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 the vision was safer, cleaner, greener with access to economic opportunity for all. But if we all work together, I said that we would be working to build one Philly, a city united. But it's not real unless you say it with me. Everybody put your ones in the air. Just like this, put your ones in the air. Let me hear you all say, one Philly, one Philly. a united city. I love you, Philly, and together we're going to get to work. Thank you.